Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air for the fifth week of the new year, 2015. Our program is presented by members and friends of Aware, a local peace group. Aware is an acronym for anti-war, anti-racism effort. I'm Carl Estabrook. Aware was established 13 years ago after the 9-11 attacks by citizens of Champaign-Urbana who criticized, who realized that the U.S. government would use those crimes to justify its already long-standing attempts to exercise military control over the Middle East. Mideast gas and oil are needed by America's economic competitors in Europe and Asia, and control of them gives the U.S. an advantage over China, Germany, and other countries, including Russia. Today, terrorism has become what communism once was for American presidents, an excuse to kill people in foreign wars that are really about the control of the world economy by the American rich, the 1%. Of course, there once were communists, as there now are terrorists. But that didn't justify our government's killing 4 million people in the Vietnam War, by far the world's greatest crime since World War II. Today, our government remains what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. We as Americans should be concerned with how the government that supposedly represents us uses terrorism as an excuse to enhance the profits of the 1%. And it is working. 95% of income gains during the Obama administration have gone to the 1%, while wages have continued to be flat or declined for most Americans. The Obama administration has been able to carry on its wars while misleading and misdirecting the American populace, who in fact suffer from increasing and accelerating inequality in this country. It's clear whom the Obama administration's war policy is working for. Politics in America are no longer a matter of liberalism and conservatism, but neoliberalism, which means enhancing the profits of the 1%, and neoconservatism, which means using foreign military action to do so. With few exceptions, both major parties are neoliberal and neoconservative, and President Obama is as well. Only a few American politicians on the right and left fringes of the Republican Democratic parties are actually opposed to the Obama administration's killing of people abroad, or even at home, through our militarized police forces, who kill far more people than in other developed countries. President Obama is the fourth president in a row to bomb Iraq, and he has now attacked more countries, eight, than the Bush-Cheney administration did. They could only manage to bomb six countries. Obama is the world's leading terrorist, as Noam Chomsky says. His Terror Tuesdays, as White House aides call them, they continue, and on them he chooses people to be killed with drones. He has so far killed 5,000 people that way, including 200 children. Meanwhile, U.S. death squads, the Special Operations Command, who report directly to the President's National Security <coughs> Council, are active already this year in 105 countries around the world. Almost three-quarters of the world's countries have American warriors, American death squads uh, in them, uh, even though, of course, there are no declarations of war uh, involved here. But in his State of the Union address and elsewhere, Obama continues to lie to the only enemy he really fears, the U.S. populace, and assures us that the wars are winding down. And Americans are convinced by filthy propaganda, like the American Sniper movie, that what Obama says is true. We'll try to give a better account tonight with commentaries by Ron Zoke and Karen Aram, and I'll be back with a commentary on Special Operations Forces. But we'll begin with Ron. Ron, I forgot your title already. The Selfie Threat. <laughs> the Selfie Threat. Please. Okay, we'll start with some uh, trivia and uh, work down from there. <laughs> uh, the uh, threat of uh, the selfie picture is being taken seriously, apparently, in uh, New York State. The governor signed a uh, law recently. Uh, against people having selfies made with a tiger. 
that apparently had become a fad, <laughs> uh, especially among uh, young men there. And uh, it now carries a $500 fine in uh, New York State. More seriously, uh, there was an enormous uh, scandal in Lebanon because in some beauty contest, apparently, uh, Miss Lebanon was having her picture taken and uh, she was photobombed by Miss Israel and uh, who got into the picture also somehow. And uh, this created an enormous furor in uh, Lebanon about uh, the two of them appearing together in the uh, same picture. More seriously still, the North Miami Beach police have been using photos, maybe selfies, of young black men for target practice in their firing range. In reaction, dozens of clergy and other citizens in the area have sent in their enlarged pictures as uh, their comment on the whole situation. So uh, uh, again, make of that what you will. Some provocative articles have started to appear stating that in effect, we are already at war with Russia. Uh, not in the ordinary way, we haven't started bombing Moscow yet, but uh, uh, there's an enormous propaganda war going on now with uh, Russia and uh, the USA in particular, or their proxies in uh, Ukraine. And uh, the uh, Russian uh, rebel rebels there in Eastern Ukraine uh, constantly accusing each other of uh, uh, all sorts of horrible uh, provocations. Uh, cyber war is going on and uh, uh, some have started to ask, uh, what uh, is the point of this? What is our vital interest in uh, Ukraine that could bring on uh, a war with Russia, which will not be any trivial matter uh, by any means? So uh, more and more, the uh, question is being raised. One in particular in the Wall Street Journal was very interesting. Uh, it, we keep hearing about uh, massive troop movements and tanks being massed on the uh, Russian border ready to in, invade uh, Ukraine. And yet, if that's true, there should be some photographs of this. <laughs> All that stuff should be visible from the air. And yet, we should have some airplanes or drones or satellites in the sky capable of taking pictures of this, of this stuff, and yet there have been, there's been none. There have been some ambiguous pictures of tanks and armored personnel characters, uh, armored personnel carriers rolling by, but uh, we, we never know whose they are, where they came from, uh, and the like. And it's become more and more mysterious about uh, what's actually going on there. So uh, uh, what do we make of this? Uh, well, I'll let you uh, think about that. I just it, I, uh, don't mean to interrupt. Uh, well, I do mean to interrupt, obviously, right, because I ahead. wanted to say that Russian, the, 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 the uh, news uh, group Russian Insider suggested that the problem that you pointed to here, Ron, um, uh, perhaps is solved by the fact that uh, the Russians have figured out a way to uh, mass produce Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. <laughs> yeah. And the 9,000 Russian troops are cloaked in invisibility. Yeah, so, uh, oh, right, well, that's uh, as plausible uh, as anything else. I view both sides, else, yeah, so. in the current uh, propaganda war going on between uh, the uh, sides in the uh, uh, Ukraine as uh, having zero credibility. Uh, but uh, again, think about it. I, I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking that after what happened recently to the uh, Indonesian airline, who wants to fly over the Ukraine to find out? <laughs> right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, former CIA agent uh, Jeffrey Sterling was convicted of leaking information to uh, James Risen, which was used in his previous book about uh, American uh, operations in the... Uh, burgeoning Cold War becoming a warm war with uh, Russia. In particular, he revealed the uh, American plan, uh, 
he's charged with telling Ryzen about a CIA plan to plant uh, defective plans for atomic weapons on the Iranians. And if they had uh, uh, been so foolish as to attempt to use those plans in constructing their supposed uh, atomic weapons, uh, the weapons uh, would have failed. And um, this is one of the uh, really uh, clever CIA uh, operations, I guess, that uh, those guys are always uh, thinking of. Not only ways of discrediting uh, Fidel Castro, but uh, uh, planting uh, mistaken plans on other people who are looking for uh, nuclear weapons. This makes me ask again, why isn't the U.S. demand for a nuclear-free Middle East? Mm -hmm. That all of the restrictions and requirements that uh, we're now urging upon Iran be applied uniformly across all countries in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, this was mentioned once in the New York Times and dismissed immediately as a, a non-starter. It's just not worth thinking about or discussing at all because if it would include Israel, and you can't expect Israel to give up its atomic weapons, so uh, uh, there will be no uniform uh, denuclearization policy uh, across the Middle East. I think uh, it would be a good point for uh, Iran to make that, look, we will divest ourselves of all nuclear weapons, all the means of making nuclear weapons and uh, uh, open up inspections of the entire country in uh, total detail on the day after Israel does likewise. And uh, I think that would settle the matter very quickly. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Yeah. Senators Menendez and Kirk Mm. are urging more sanctions Our Senate. Right. Uh, upon the uh, uh, Iranians. Uh, they don't like being called warmongers <laughs> any more than other warmongers do, apparently. But uh, uh, there again, you will have to uh, make up your own mind about that. Uh, note in the Greek situation, the increasing popularity of the words populist and fringe, not to mention radical and extreme in, in describing what's going on in uh, Greece with the election of the uh, Syriza party to uh, uh, power, taking uh, 149 seats in the Greek legislature and uh, the head of the party being sworn in as prime minister in Greece. Enormous con concern in the rest of uh, Europe about uh, these people doing irresponsible things in repudiating uh, some of the Greek debt or demanding it, that it be uh, renegotiated uh, anyway. Finally, a uh, curious note this week of a dro drone landing on the White House lawn. <laughs> this, I think, is a foreshadowing of what's to come since we're so infatu infatuated with using drones to uh, uh, liquidate uh, the opposition, as they used to say. Uh, now that the precedent and the, uh, has been set and the rationale elaborated, I think we can expect more and more of that in the future. Our technological advantage in putting drones in the air uh, will eventually become, as all scientific and technical uh, advantages ultimately will. Uh, you can't keep those away from other people uh, indefinitely. And uh, so eventually, will the, uh, the sky be dark with drones approaching the White House, the Pentagon, and uh, uh, what else? So uh, uh, since we're so deeply in love with them, maybe other people will be, um, develop an equal affection for using those drones to, uh, um, shall we say, uh, remove the uh, opposition. And there I'll stop. Thank you, Ron. Uh, you're watching Aware on the Air. Uh, we're 
Our topic is war and rumors of war, uh, the war that is, in fact, being encouraged around the world by the American government, by the Obama administration, <coughs> which remains, as Martin Luther King said long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Uh, it's uh, quite remarkable we do not hear from American politicians uh, except those on the very fringe of the American political discussion, the notion that the U.S. would simply withdraw troops from the thousand bases it has around the world and the hundred and or uh, more than a hundred countries in which it has uh, special operation forces, that is, death squads working. Uh, the U.S. should simply withdraw these, and uh, as uh, Noam Chomsky has said, the best way to uh, combat terrorism is to stop participating in it. And since the greatest terrorist pro project in the world today is, in fact, uh, President Obama's drones, that would be the place to start. Uh, we'll go on now to uh, Karen Aram. Well, I'm going to read today from an article by Eric Zuis. Uh, he is a, um, an award, a Mencken Award winning uh, investigative journalist and author. And uh, he, his article is taken from uh, Russia's RIA Novosti News Agency. And this is that China is demanding a refund of about $3 billion, half of that in cash and an additional half in uh, Chinese goods from Ukraine. Uh, these were paid in advance by China in 2013 and uh, for a 2012 Chinese order of grain from the Ukraine, which goods still have not been supplied. Uh, the State Food and Grain Corporation of Ukraine um, supplied grain in 2013 elsewhere, but not to China. And they're claiming that, um, uh, they're saying that the Ukraine won't be able to supply the grain to China because we don't have it. And the reason he gives is that there's a big shortage of technicians, that is combiners, adjusters, mechanics, farm machinery operators, all of them were taken by the army. And no one argues with the military. He said these men are being required to fight in the Ukraine's anti-terrorist operation that's occurring in Ukraine's former Donbass region. That's the place where the residents don't accept the new Ukrainian government's legitimacy, and they are therefore being called terrorists by this new government, which is thus bombing them, supposedly, in order to convince them that this new government's authority over them is legitimate even though the residents there never participated in its election and have been cut off even from Ukraine's social security payments. Now, in addition, um, they also, uh, China also advanced um, to the Ukraine to pay for growing and shipping. Well, we, I've already discussed that, but bottom line, uh, <laughs> the, re the RIAN report also says that China is very angry about this. They said that in addition to China's $3 billion loan, that's to be repaid with grain, they also, the Ukraine also received from China a $3.6 billion loan to pay for the gasification of coal mm -hmm. by Ukraine's gas company, Naftogaz, which the Ukrainian government has guaranteed up to $2.3 billion. Now, if China, now evidently they think this is going to go to court, but if China decides to call in that loan, the result will be bankruptcy of either NAFTA gas or the Ukrainian government. Now, on January 9th, now you have to keep in mind, this was all done under the previous government before um, Yasen, uh, Yasenyuk, <laughs> Arseny Yatsenyuk. That's the current uh, prime minister. Yes, as, as yeah, sorry, uh, Victoria I, Newland calls him. Yeah, okay, because I'm stumbling over it. But this, this occurred, and this is just trivia I'm going to mention here, but this actually occurred under the, uh, they, they were doing the business uh, with the pre-Yanukovych administrations, um, mm -hmm. uh, Yulia, but they refused to uh, do business with her. They, they wanted to wait until Yanukovych became president and then he came, and of course, since he was ousted, now they're dealing with, with uh, our man, yeah, Yat. Okay, now, Yat has reassured the IMF, EU, and other investors of all funds that are being loaned to the Ukraine that the Ukraine is doing everything possible to fulfill on its financial obligations to all investors. And now I quote, 
I would also like to note that the money that we get in the framework of international financial assistance does not go to finance the state budget deficit. It does not go to the payment of pensions. It does not go to the payment of wages. All of this is happening in the first place solely to perform our external obligations. Uh, and by external obligations, the money which comes from taxpayers in the U.S. and the EU, not from the aristocrats whose investments the IMF protects and whom the IMF actually serves, had stated that the Ukraine's first obligation, without which the IMF would lend no more money, is to win the war against Donbass. Okay? Now, Yats thus is here reassuring the IMF and other investors in the Ukraine that their money will not go to pay for anything but winning this war. So, the natural gas and other assets that are in the ground in that region will not become available to be sold off by the Ukrainian government in order to pay off those investors. Instead, the residents there, that's the people who the Ukrainian government is now trying to eliminate, will, would control those assets as being assets of a separate state, one which is not borrowed from these investors. So, that, that's the reason why they, they don't, the Ukrainian government must win, okay, must win this war because it demands, it is, the IMF wants the assets that are there, not the people who are living on it. So that's why they are demanding victory. That is the elimination of the people in Donbass or else the Ukraine will promptly go bankrupt. And perhaps so too would some of the investors. So, and how many people have we estimated have been killed in Donbass so far? More than 5,000. More than 5,000. The UN, okay. UN said just this week. Yeah, yeah. so th this is a war that is occurring uh, through the Ukrainian government um, with these people of Donbass, uh, and um, we know who's supporting them. I mean, that's already come out. That's already been proven. Thank you, Karen. That's, uh, that's a very important story and one that obviously is being completely ignored by the American media. Uh, except for occasional jabs at uh, uh, the president mm -hmm. of Russia and his supposedly mad imperial ambitions, which uh, is the source of all this. <laughs> in fact, this, the story is just the opposite. Uh, it's what the U.S. has done in Ukraine that has produced 5,000 dead peoples in the mm -hmm. Donbass region. The Donbass region is the eastern part of, uh, of Ukraine, um, the part close on the border with Russia. Uh, the two major regions within it are Donetsk and uh, uh, Luhansk, and we have uh, uh, Ron's uh, brilliant summary of the uh, story uh, about what the U.S. is doing there uh, from some uh, weeks ago under the title, Donetsk, Don't Tell. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, the U.S. does not tell what is the source of uh, this vicious war in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, which, as I say, most Americans don't know about, uh, and most of us probably even couldn't find Ukraine on a map, unless perhaps our parents or grandparents came from there, like Noam Chomsky's did. Um, but the uh, 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 situation is quite serious, and it's a result of American policy. That's the point that we need to get across, uh, uh, that, that the, the reason it's not being discussed is that it's part of this worldwide war policy, and it's nothing less than that, that the Obama administration is carrying on while trying to hide it, uh, at least mainly, at least uh, strenuously de-emphasize it in discussions with the American people. If we listen to what the White House says, uh, it's uh, war, war problems are being um, uh, uh, handled, wars are being wound down. But in fact, the U.S. is directly responsible for uh, mass murder in eastern Ukraine uh, in that it arranged a coup in Ukraine that threw out a legitimately elected president. No one really doubted that the uh, president of Ukraine was legitimately elected, but um, a coup encouraged by uh, the American State Department, uh, particularly in the, purpose, in the person of Victoria Nuland, uh, who not only spent uh, a great deal of money to produce the coup, but also personally showed up on the scene in Kiev and distributed cookies, according to the story they came, to the protesters who eventually overthrew the elected government. Now, the government that's in place, the Coosters, uh, the uh, uh, 
government presided now over by, by the chocolate king, as he's called, Peter Poroshenko, uh, one of the oligarchs in Ukraine, and he personally made his money apparently from chocolate, uh, hence the name. Uh, this group in uh, Kiev uh, launched a new attack a week ago last Sunday against the Donbass region. Now, the Donbass region has simply said from the time of the coup that it will not be governed, it does not wish to be governed by the coosters in Kiev, uh, many of whom uh, are associated with the far-right parties, including explicitly fascist and neo-Nazi parties uh, that uh, exist in Ukraine. Uh, the people of Donbass uh, have said that they intend to run their own affairs uh, in some form of federal relationship uh, with the government of Ukraine, they certainly do not wish to be run, uh, to be governed by the Kiev government. In response, the Kiev government attacked them. It launched a war against Donbass, and it renewed that war. The war didn't go very well from the point of view of Kiev, but it renewed the war a week ago last Sunday, and the fighting has been quite serious uh, in the region ever since then. Now, I think the point that needs to be made for us as Americans is that this war is a result of American policy and a result of the long-term American policy to try to make sure that uh, uh, the Russian economy is not able to control uh, Eurasia. If you want to hear a, a theoretical account of why this should be American policy, um, I recommend uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's book from almost 10 years ago now, I think, called The Grand Chessboard, isn't that what Brzezinski's book is called? Brzezinski uh, is a senior American uh, policymaker. Uh, he has been active in American politics uh, since the Carter administration. He was Jimmy, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, and he's responsible in some ways uh, for the uh, uh, wars in the Middle East. It was Brzezinski, who, according to his own account, an account he gave to a French newspaper, um, encouraged in the Carter administration the gathering of the most fanatical fighters uh, that could be found, uh, the Islamic extremists that uh, we have heard about so much recently and no one heard about in the 1970s. Uh, the, Amer the United States, with the aid of Saudi Arabia, under Brzezinski's uh, direction, gathered together these fighters and sent them into Afghanistan before the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, but because Afghanistan, uh, under Russian influence, had produced a government um, that uh, uh, was uh, friendly uh, to Russian, uh, to the Soviet Union. Um, this was before the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, Brzezinski's account then was uh, well, we're going to find these terrorists, the Mujahideen, and send them into uh, to Afghanistan to attack the Afghan government in order, this is a quote, to give Russia a Vietnam of its own. Now, uh, the Mujahideen who were sent to Afghanistan included the uh, uh, elements that would become al-Qaeda, uh, and so it's quite correct to say that the U.S. Uh, formed al-Qaeda uh, it formed the fighters and the jihadists, uh, who are the background of al-Qaeda and indeed the background of the Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria right now. So that's Brzezinski, um, and he is uh, uh, nobody's fool. Uh, he talks about what he has in mind, and at the center of uh, American policy planning as long ago as the 1970s, uh, was Brzezinski's notion that control of Central Asia, control of Eurasia, control of Russia and China uh, and the uh, lands in between was crucial to American hegemony in the world at large. The profits of the American 1% depended upon the sort of control that the U.S. had had in the world since the end of World War II and the central theater for that uh, uh, control for the establishment of that control would be Eurasia, would be uh, Russia and China. Well, as prophecy, that's pretty good. Um, it's pretty good because it directed what the U.S. has done and is doing uh, right now. And the, pre the present campaign um, against Putin's Russia 
uh, has not only driven Russia deeper into the arms of China, but has also uh, uh, produced uh, the massive killing that's going on in, uh, uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, while we're speaking. Uh, this is a U.S. policy, a policy of the Obama administration, not an accident, not something they backed into, not something they inherited from an earlier administration. It's something they have chosen to do, certainly consistent with the foreign policy of early administra earlier administrations, but the Ukrainian crimes, and that's what the U.S. is responsible for, the Ukrainian crimes seem to be particularly a, um, uh, a uh, result of uh, American policy, uh, policy of the Obama administration. So this theme that you both brought up this evening seems to me to be particularly important right now because there's a war that's going on that most Americans don't know about at all uh, and is killing as many people as the drone war. Appendix to that, uh, we've been getting some reports now by, uh, about the uh, uh, Kievian uh, fighters in uh, U eastern Ukraine. Uh, some of them are discovered to be uh, speaking perfect English yeah. Uh, unaccented, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> uh, this raises other questions. Right. It's been known for some time that uh, uh, mercenaries have been uh, active there and uh, operating in the area. And uh, is this the uh, CIA contingent supported by the uh, uh, USA that is taking part in the uh, fight of? of the supposed patriotic uh, Ukrainians against the uh, horrible Russian invaders. Uh, we'll see. Well, <clears throat> um, the former black ops, I can't keep up with their name change. Yeah, they've uh, changed names many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've seen things, sparkling of things, that they are there. <clears throat> but I also have seen things that make it very clear that any U.S. company of mercenaries, whoever they are, wherever they are, we know they operate out of Dubai, <coughs> still probably have the stamp of approval from the U.S. government. It's, al it's almost, uh, it it's highly unlikely, okay? Mercenary individuals are a different subject, but these are groups. And it's what is Blackwater called now? I mean, they um, change they oh, change their names so up, often. Yeah. And Blackwater. I, why I why think, would they want to do that? Do you suppose? Oh, gee. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, when they were uh, being pro oh, they keep they keep changing. I know they've had at least three different names, and I can't keep up. So I just keep referring to them as Black Blackwater because that's um, the well. famous name of the book that Jeremy Scahill wrote. I mean, right. uh, and that's what most people remember them as. So they can change their name as many times as they want, but we all know who they are. Scahill, who wrote the book Dirty Wars, uh, and a lot of the uh, information in that book was about the activities of Blackwater. And they're, they're not the only American mercenary group, but they're one of the principal, yeah. one of the principal ones. Scahill has been one of the few reporters who's been talking about what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, Democracy Now!, which uh, uh, can be quite uneven on issues <coughs> like this and other issues as well, uh, has, uh, to its credit, been giving an account of what's going on in Ukraine, uh, a lot of it from Scahill. And uh, it was, it's important that, the, uh, uh, that Americans hear about this. It says something, I think, about what the American government is doing, what the, Amer the Obama administration is doing, that um, they have to do this uh, secretly. Uh, the sorts of things that the U.S. is doing to promote war around the world, the killing of people around the world, um, is done in secret, and it's in secret not obviously from the people who are, are suffering, under these American-sponsored attacks, but it's secret from the American people. Uh, that's the important point. Uh, Barack Obama, in his book, his audition piece to become president, uh, a book entitled The Audacity of Hope, was published two years before his election, uh, talks about the uh, uh, anti-war movement uh, in the Vietnam era. 
Uh, and it's very clear that in thinking about his own role as a, uh, uh, an American executive, he wants to be sure that his fate is not like that of Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon. Uh, presidents driven from office by, essentially, outrage on the part of the American populace at the war policy they're carrying out abroad. How do you do that? Well, Obama's way has been to keep the, keep the war secret. Uh, the drone program uh, is a secret program. The only reason we know about the sorts of uh, things that the president does when he chooses people to be killed on terror to every Terror Tuesday um, is that uh, we hear from the victims. We hear from the places in which the drones fall. We hear, for example, just this week that there is a new drone attack in, uh, in Yemen uh, that killed children. Now, uh, that's not because the administration has announced it. That's not because the administration has um, said anything about where its authority comes from to uh, kill people in Yemen, but because people in Yemen talk about what has happened there. Uh, and Yemen is in the midst of a political crisis of its own. Uh, that seems not to bother the U.S. It has its own fish to fry or its own people to kill. And Obama continues to send uh, uh, drones into Yemen. Uh, so this is, the, this is the war policy the U.S. is following. And, um, it's this which is um, uh, um, being kept from the American people by misdirection, by misreporting, by underreporting, by non-reporting by the American media. Now, this isn't new. Um, there is a parallel, an important parallel. Uh, when the Reagan administration came into office in 1981, uh, it inherited the wars that I was talking about a moment ago, that Zbigniew Brzezinski had presided over in the previous administration, in the Carter administration. Uh, and the, Obama, uh, the uh, Reagan administration in 1981 said, um, uh, well, look, we have got to stop doing this clandestinely. Let's do it openly. Let's, uh, for example, invade Central America the way John Kennedy invaded Southeast Asia. That was the planning in the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration in 1981 modeled itself on the Kennedy administration 20 years earlier uh, and intended to act in the same way. What the Kennedy people had done in Southeast Asia, the Reaganites wanted to do in Central America. But they ran into a problem. Uh, the problem that came to be called the Vietnam Syndrome. The Vietnam Syndrome was the unwillingness of the American populace to support foreign wars which were being fought for uh, the purposes, for the profits of the American 1% and were not in any way in the interest of the American people. Uh, we kept trying to, uh, the Reagan administration kept trying to describe ways in which war in Central America would be um, uh, in the interest of the American people, but they couldn't do it. The result was that the Reagan war policy uh, was driven underground. It, was, it became covert. Uh, it became a basis for um, uh, uh, clandestine war and support for insurgent groups uh, like the Contras in Nicaragua uh, that couldn't be justified before the American populace. Now, it's interesting, another 30 years on, the extent to which uh, the Obama administration's war policy resembles the Reagan underground war and in both cases, uh, are imitating the above-ground war that the uh, uh, Kennedy administration was able to, uh, able to carry on uh, many years before. So it's an advance, I suppose, you have to say, that uh, American war policy, American imperialist war making, uh, can't be done openly uh, today, quite so much as it could be done openly in the times of uh, John Kennedy. Uh, that's got to be an advance, although the differences may be lost on the people who are dying under Obama's drones, eh? Yeah. So what do you think of, about all of the uh, praise that's uh, being heaped upon the deceased Saudi king? Uh, we're being told what a wise and oh, that's great, ridiculous. <laughs> great man <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And uh, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, we're hearing uh, less in that case about freedom, democracy, and human rights, which is the usual routine of uh, 
uh, American uh, propagandists. So uh, when all that talk goes out the window instantly, of course, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, and uh, we're continuing to uh, praise our uh, wonderful allies there uh, among the Saudis, who uh, no one is mentioning, happen to be very big on uh, 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 suppressing freedom, democracy, and human rights. Yeah. Another curious case is Cuba, where the American representative just came back, and the first thing she did when she hit the ground, of course, was to uh, look for dissidents to uh, interview <laughs> uh. Uh, about uh, the horrors of uh, life in, in communist uh, Cuba. So uh, um, at the same time, it's curious that she never thinks about interviewing dissidents in the USA, for example, and uh, getting that, that their would stories. be us, right? Yeah, oh, yes. right, right. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, really marvelous the way uh, this goes. No, we, we incarcerate some of our dissidents. Yeah, yeah that's Kathy right. Kathy Kelly right. started her incarceration yeah. in jail uh, as of the 23rd, I believe. So, uh, yeah. yeah, their um, dissidents in Cuba and China and elsewhere are uh, wonderful uh, heroes and saints and martyrs for uh, freedom, democracy, and human rights. But here in the USA, dissidents are uh, uh, misfits and malcontents. I think there's an interesting contradiction in the uh, uh, first case that you mentioned, Ron, that is uh, the, our Secretary of State rushing home from, uh, sorry, not Secretary of State, the President rushing home from India, uh, where he's busily tilting towards Asia, right, right, Karen? Right, uh, Rushes right. home from India in order to uh, 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 attend the uh, installment of the new Saudi dictator. Um, what's going on here when the major propaganda enterprise that's going on in this country about the uh, Obama wars uh, is um, a Clint Eastwood's film, American Sniper, and we're told about how uh, it necessary it is to kill savages, i.e. Iraqis in this case, uh, the anti-Muslim propaganda that the administration uh, does not directly support, of course, but it does, as it were, uh, uh, acquiesce in. Uh, that anti-Muslim propaganda runs into a certain problem when we talk about uh, the honoring the U.S. offers to the, the uh, most uh, reactionary Muslim state in the world, that is Saudi Arabia. What's going on here? Yeah, We've been joined by David Johnson <laughs> and may have a view on this. <laughs> well, it's uh, just typical propaganda as usual, Carl. I mean, uh, I think that's a very excellent point about uh, contrasting, uh, uh, you know, what they're the, the propaganda about these horrible uh, Islamic fanatics, which of course is true. But Saudi Arabia is one of the most uh, fanatical, dictatorial Islamic countries in the world, uh, right next to Bahrain, uh, an, another such country that does it basically uh, horribly suppresses their uh, mm -hmm. dissidents. Uh, and pro-democracy people, but yet you don't hear a word of this in the U.S. corporate media, uh, quite on the contrary. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, more the same, it looks like. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, let's not forget that the, the uh, wars ab abroad um, are also ha are coming home here uh, as well. I mean, it's interesting how, you know, we learn from history, but so does the ruling class. And the ruling class, the 1%, uh, they have a, an agenda, they have a 10, even a 20 year plan, and they are not about to back down. They are not going to, they have concluded that they uh, are not going to back down uh, like they did in the 60s and the 70s, and they're going to do whatever it takes, uh, whether it be uh, internationally, or abroad, or here at home, to stop anybody uh, that's going to try to, uh, you know, alter their plans. And that includes uh, police killing unarmed people in our cities. Uh, as well as other places in the country. Uh, that includes jailing whistleblowers who expose the illegality and misconduct of our government, and the list goes on. I would say it was more than a 20-year plan, too, at least the recent one. It, even, it has a name, neoliberalism, uh, although most Americans are not particularly familiar with it, but it is a conscious plan that took off in the 70s and the Carter administration, we've been talking about a bit this evening, uh, to uh, produce... Uh, 
a uh, economic and indeed military situation in the United States that rolled back the 60s, that rolled back the Vietnam syndrome, that rolled back the social supports that grew out of the 60s and the great society of the Johnson administration and so forth. That's been the name of the game for the American ascendancy, for the American 1% for almost 40 years now. And uh, they seem to be winning, don't they? Well, it's just getting worse, Carl. I mean, they're, they're basically, uh, it, it's, you know, gr definitely. I mean, this started, I mean, let's put it this way. We, we made some great progress in this country in the 60s, uh, into the 70s, and then the empire struck back. Exactly. But it's been, and it's been getting exponentially worse. Uh, I, mean, I think you're right. Uh, every, every year or so. And, I mean, it seems like just in the last couple of years, it's getting even more worse. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a question of how far is this going to go? I mean, how far are, are the 1%, the, the ruling elites of our country and their counterparts in Europe, uh, and some countries in Asia, are they willing to go? I mean, basically they're putting um, <laughs> not just democracy at risk, not just uh, the standard of living your average working person, both here and abroad, but I mean, they're literally uh, endangering the entire planet we live on. And exactly. this has to be realized that uh, if these people are allowed to continue their agenda, uh, I, I just shudder to think what the future holds in five, ten years or more. <laughs> Uh, are you being an alarmist? Yeah. I'm being a realist, Ron. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean did, did, did I'm be that, optimistic. I think. I'm optimistic, yeah. but yet I, I'm saying if the trend, if the trajectory continues, the trend continues, uh, it's going to be bad unless we 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 do more. Three minutes till midnight, according to scientists <laughs> ah, and intellectuals out there. That's an interesting point. Explain Re that reference, Karen. I think that's no. A, I don't yeah. want to explain it. I'll let you explain it. <laughs> But well, it's on the cover of the bulletin of the atomic right. scientists. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. There you go. And uh, yeah. they've, for years, have been putting on the, the cover this picture of a clock with the minute hand getting closer or farther away from midnight as a warning of about what is in store for us, a global uh, disaster, depending on their judgment of uh, world tensions and conflicts at uh, different points in time. And, and the environment. And the environment now. Yes. And yes. that's actually, the environment uh, uh, is the primary reason that they've uh, decreased the uh, mm -hmm. time to midnight on the cover of the magazine recently, right? Mm -hmm. Although it's, as Ron was talking about earlier, it's a mistake to ignore the question of nuclear, nuclear war politics here. Uh, most Americans think, oh, nuclear war, that was a problem uh, when the Soviet Union was around and the Soviet Union was threatening everyone with nuclear war, which of course is... American uh, mythology once again, uh, but it's not a problem anymore. That's quite false, and for quite false for some of the reasons that we've been talking about this evening. So, uh, yeah, the bulletin of, of, of the atomic scientists uh, are uh, unfortunately probably all too justified in, in decreasing the time to midnight on the cover of their magazine. Um, you're watching Aware on the Air. We're talking about war and rumors of war as they exist in the, uh, in the world today and as they are a result of the policy of the government for which we are supposedly responsible. Uh, and therefore, it should be a very real concern of ours, not only as victims, but as perpetrators of uh, the wars around the world right now. Um, wanted, I wanted to mention an example of this. Uh, that uh, comes from that particular cloud cuckoo land where uh, Victoria <laughs> Newland uh, in the State Department lives. It's a very dangerous land. It's not a, it's not a joke, as uh, uh, some people would say, uh, but there is a certainly a joking aspect to it, I suppose. The man who was installed by the U.S. as president of Ukraine, uh, the uh, Victoria Newland's toy boy, uh, her uh, candidate for the presidency of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, Yats, as she calls him. His name has a multisyllabic name that apparently is difficult for Ms. Newland to pronounce. Um, Yats uh, uh, was her candidate, and she uh, uh, put it within the limits of television uh, uh, decorum, uh, dismissed the Europeans particularly the Germans candidate for the presidency of Ukraine uh, as they engineered their coup on the grounds that uh, the Germans were junior partners in this arrangement and that the U.S. would have its 
character as the president of the country. Well, the character they chose, Yats um, said a very peculiar thing last week. He said um, he wanted to be sure that uh, Russia would not use Ukraine uh, to attack Germany as it did once before. <laughs> I, I'm not making this up. Now, people scratched their heads at that for a while, and what he appeared to be saying, what he apparently indeed was saying, was that the Second World War would be to under, was to be understood as an attack by the USSR on Germany, and that he, Yats, was standing there as the bulwark against the Russians repeating that attack against Germany, uh, which caused such misery uh, in the 1940s. Now, this is amazing. I mean, you, if you can't get your, your, your puppets uh, to talk right, uh, you'd better examine the whole play, it seems to me. Um, it's, not, it's nuts. It's crazy. But that was what was being said by the uh, uh, American, um, uh, the American puppet in Ukraine, and a discussion of the Ukrainian war that you know everyone knows is mad. What's <laughs> happening here? I mean, they can't come up with the State Department doesn't have better propagandists than that, uh, or or do they just rely on weak reads? like the president of Ukraine, uh, in order to accomplish their, uh, uh, their wonders. Uh, a well, very strange business. Yeah. The puppet may turn out to be a tar baby that we're sinking ever deeper into without knowing what is at the end of that road. Well, I think that's true. I, I would uh, reject the image only on the, uh, you know, in the sense that uh, the U.S doesn't know what it's getting into. I'm afraid it does know what it's going getting into and is willing to do I'm it. Talking about most of us. <laughs> oh, most of us, yeah. Well, right. the rest of it. That's but that's the important point. Yeah. The rest of us are being dragged along there mm -hmm. uh, with the misrepresentations of the uh, um, uh, of the American government and its uh, uh, cooperators in the corporate media. Uh, and uh, if we don't know what's going on, uh, it's pretty hard to work up much of an objection to it. Uh, that's what we should be doing. Can I make an announcement? Sure. Uh, the Prairie Greens or the Green Party Champaign Urbana is holding a public forum Saturday, January 31st. Uh, that's this Saturday at 2 p.m. in the Champaign Public Library, Robeson Room A. And you're all invited. Okay. Um, and. Um, Carl, have you heard um, any uh, uh, credible reports about uh, uh, foreign mercenaries, in particular uh, some with uh, British and American yes. accents fighting in Ukrainian uniforms uh, in yeah. trying to take back the uh, uh, Donetsk and the other uh, province in uh, eastern Ukraine that wants to uh, be separate themselves from this uh, uh, idiot lunatic uh, in Kiev? We mentioned that just before you came in, uh, okay. uh, David, mm -hmm. and it's, it's important, it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting that this is an example of something that sort of slipped through the media grid. I mean, uh, uh, all, all, almost amusing in the fact that uh, what was being uh, uh, reported by uh, Russian television, it, it wasn't RT, it was um, uh, I don't remember. another Russian news source. It was an accidental interview, as it were, in the city of Maripol, right. where there had been an attack that killed, uh, that killed a number of people in one region of the city. Both sides in the Ukrainian war blamed the other for the attack. And in coverage of the attack, this is this, just p this past week, a reporter finds a, a man in a Ukrainian army uniform, that is the Kiev government's uh, army, uh, and um, as they try to talk to this guy going through the area that has hit, been hit by these, uh, by these rockets, uh, the guy says in English, get out of my face. <laughs> And, uh, in an question, American accent, no less. <laughs> yeah, That's it's, so uh, actually, there's a later report that in fact he was a Brit. So I mean, oh, you know, okay. uh, I saw that. Uh, I saw that same report. Yeah. And it was the same film footage, and uh -huh. it was one instance where there was. Uh, it was that was one where the, the person had an American accent, but there was another scene in the same location where the, they picked up audio of the guy 
talking to another one with a British accent. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there was basically two uh, English-speaking uh, uh, soldiers in uh, Ukrainian uniforms, uh, one with a British accent and one with an American accent, both in the same uh, mm -hmm. uh, air, immediate area. Well, we remember, of course, that the U.S. is, uh, the Obama administration has already said, well, of course, we needed money uh, for uh, sending American trainers to Ukraine. And that is in the current that is in the current budget requests. Uh, the uh, but but something else is going in here that Karen was talking about earlier, and that is the American mercenaries from Blackwater and other groups that are clearly uh, in uh, in play in the uh, in Ukraine. Um, there's an aspect here of the America's worldwide war making in the Obama administration that we should not ignore. Uh, and that is the use of mercenaries rather than direct American troops uh, alongside American special forces uh, throughout the world. Uh, many of the troops that the U.S. has in the Middle East right now are mercenaries and obviously apparently uh, uh, we do in Ukraine as well. So to, the only mistake here would be not to understand this, a part, th this as a part of American that is to say Obama administration war policy around the world. They're not, these aren't accidents. They, they know what they're doing uh, in one sense of the word. Carl, was there any mention earlier in the show about the recent uh, Greek elections? We did, but we, I don't think we have time to take it up right now. Okay, that's uh, very good. Okay. The, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very important, yes. uh, it, mm -hmm. certainly in terms of uh, uh, the, the world economy. Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, I don't think has been particularly well reported in the country at all. Mm -hmm. at all. People should pay attention what's, to what's happened in, uh, in Greece and the rejection by the Greek electorate of the austerity policy yeah. was there. Uh, but that's uh, probably a discussion for another day. Okay. You've been watching Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group in the fifth week of the new year, 2015. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett, thanks to whom also this program and others like it will be available on YouTube. And see the Facebook page for AWARE for articles that we've mentioned and for comments by ourselves and by viewers. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about, but Americans don't. Manning, Assange, Snowden, and the others who are being persecuted by the Obama administration. Now this is Carl Esterbrook for Ron Zoak, Karen Evans-Levy, Stuart Levy, Karen Aram, David Johnson, David Green, and other members and friends of AWARE, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck. <laughs>